as every Sunday, my number one goal is that anybody that walks in to this room, into this church, that doesn't know the Lord, I want them to walk out knowing Him. If you've never been saved, if you have never had an experience with Christ where you invited Him to come into your life, you owned your sin, you come to Him with a repentant heart and ask Him to forgive your sin and save you, I want you to know that you can have Jesus today. That's always our message. There will never be a Sunday here where I do not give you an opportunity to become a Christian because that's what it means to become a Christian. Not just going to church, but having a time in your life where you accepted Christ as your personal Savior. Mine came when I was seven years old. We could go around this room at all stages of life, some as a child, some of you became a Christian at, uh, uh, as an adult, as a parent, as a grandparent. I want you to understand that that is the most important decision you'll ever make. That being said, I want you to know that at the end of this message, I'll give you an opportunity to become a Christian. Where we have been this year as a church is we have been addressing those of us primarily who are Christians and tailoring our life, every aspect of our life, to be able to bring glory and honor to God. I want families and homes in this room to bring glory to God. You um, husbands and wives that are, you don't have kids at home anymore. I want your marriage to bring glory and honor to God. Those of you who do have kids at home, I want your family and your home life to bring glory and honor to God. You teenagers, I want your student life at school and the activities that you do to bring glory and honor to God. Every employee in here, I want your, your daily uh, work that you do to bring glory and honor to God. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's what I want you to do. I want you to run everything through that filter of, is the way I handle this going to bring glory to God or not? Every person you encounter, every decision you make with that in mind. A couple of weeks ago, we brought you a message primarily to parents. The role of a parent. It was on the 17th of February. You can go back on YouTube. You can check it out and watch it. We said this, if you're going to be a parent, there is specific things in your life that you need to be able to be ready to be a parent, okay? And I cited you some stats that statistically speaking, the Brookings Institute did a big long study. They used to, to measure success in life of, you've heard below the poverty level, above the poverty level, and we kind of judge whether we're successful or not based on that. But if you take, they used to, to look and the, the determining factor was education. So if you had a good education, you were more likely to be uh, successful financially in life. And if you didn't have a good education, you would be below the line. Then it was the economy. How was the economy doing? But now they're looking differently and our success financially in our lives are based on the decisions we make in our teenage years and our early adult years. They say this, if you graduate high school, number one, graduate high school, you're on your way to success. Number two, if you wait until you are married to have children, you're on your way to success. Number three, if you wait to get married or have children until after 20, if you do those three things, graduate, don't get married, or don't get married, <laughs> you'll be successful, amen? Uh, no. If you, if you wait until after 20 to get married and don't have kids before then, you are 83% likely to be above the poverty line. But if you do one of those things, if you don't graduate high school, if you have kids before you're married, you have a 79% chance of being below the poverty line. There's a direct correlation to our success in life here in America to this, the decisions that we make. We told you this, if you are going to be ready to be a parent at a certain time in your life, then you've got to realize that you cannot be sexually active at the wrong times in your life, or that's when issues come up. We've got to control our bodies, and we talked about that you, according to Matthew chapter 19, we are to 
grow God's specific. And, and let, let me let me understand this or let me say this, because a lot of times I, I want to tell you, you, you know, God's primary drawn up plan. If you let him have, have his will and way, this is what it would look like. Now, I know that there's all kinds of scenarios in here. And you say, Brandon, you know, I, 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 you know, I got married. I got divorced. Okay. Now, I'm just now figuring out this whole spirituality thing. And I've got, a, I've got 20 years behind me of kind of making wrong decisions and getting in bad relationships. I want you to understand that the mercy of God is new every morning. Okay. I want you to understand that, that God can only work with us from here on, right? We can't change anything in our past. So I want you to hold your head high. Um, um, but I, I, I do want to say one thing. I want you 13, 14, 15 year olds. I don't, my goal for you is that you do not have three marriages or four marriages down the road or that you don't even have two. I want you to find, you know what I believe? You know what I want for my kids? I want them to realize that I believe in it. And you, you can disagree with this. I believe that God has a specific person out there for my son and a specific uh, uh, man out there uh, for my daughter. My daughter went to a gymnastics meet this week. Uh, she competed, and she got to watch the, uh, the, in the same place they were having uh, uh, some deal. And it was uh, like the Olympic people, okay? And they had the men's, and I think she found her man. <laughs> She's telling me, Dad, oh, my goodness. She pops it up. He's 23. His muscles are about... About like that. Uh, you know, I mean, they're just, he just, and, and, and I'm like, why, is he, why are you showing me one without his shirt on? Okay. Like, first of all, all right. And she's like, mm -mm -mm. okay. And I'm like, you are 11 years old. Repent of your sin. Okay. So, hey, hey, but I believe that there is a young man out there that's going to marry my daughter one day. Okay. I cringe when I think of it, but I, I, I believe it. I believe there's a young lady out there that is going to marry my son one day and I pray for that young lady and I pray for uh I pray for <laughs> what did I say what I pray for that, but that young man did I say that what I don't know y'all just let me preach this sermon okay I pray for my children's future spouses that all right um I, I do I want them hey my mom did that for me okay and I believe that there's somebody out there, and I believe, and I want them to have happiness. I want them to find joy. I want them to find that person that God made them for and made for them. And I believe that a husband and a wife complete each other. And I want them to come together, and I want them to complete each other, and I want them to be happy. They're going to have ups and downs. I understand that. But I don't want them to have, I want them to learn the lessons of everybody else that's gone down the road and, and made the mistakes and wish they could go back 40 years and change some things. And I, we also said that if we're going to be parents, when we're ready at the right time, there's a, there is a prescription for that in the Bible, that the number one lesson, parenting lesson that we can learn is to be a godly example. Okay. I told you about my dad and just the example that he set. A lot of us say and tell our children what to do, but we don't do it. And I told you two weeks ago, say it, but don't do it won't work because they'll rebel against that. But sometimes if you just do it, and maybe you're not real good at saying it, because I know a lot of us, hey, you know, you're not, you know, a lot of dads especially, I see this, and maybe it's the same way with women, but I don't know because I'm not a woman. But a lot of times it's, it's tough to talk to the, to the young men, and, we, we, you know, we, 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 we are men a few words, right? We just kind of grunt at each other, and we think, yeah, yeah, you got the point, right? You know, like, you know, it's not easy for us to come out with our emotions and, and hey, I love you, and I want you to do this, and, and, and talk about tough things, especially spiritual things. I see that a lot in dads. It's not easy for us to talk about spiritual things. But the main thing is, is that you be a good example in your actions, even if you're not great at saying it. If you do it but don't say it, They'll get a lot of those lessons. Primarily, I want you to do it and say it, okay? I want you to do it and say it and teach them the, the right way. We said we got to train our children. Train means hard, it implies hard work and repetition. If you're training for a marathon, it is hard work and repetition. If you're lifting weights, it's hard work and repetition. If you're, if you're trying to get a, be a better basketball player, better baseball player, if you're trying to get better at, at your job, it is hard work and repetition, doing the same things over and over and over again. Training, taking them down the well-worn path. And then we said the last thing was is that parents must be consistent. Consistent. Consistent in their love. Consistent, consistent in their firmness. Consistent in their discipline. And I want to pick up on that last word that I just said this morning. I want to talk to you for a few minutes on the subject of discipline. And I'm not talking about 
I'm just to parents this morning. I'm talking to Christians. And I want to talk to you on this subject of discipline because you might be surprised that you and I, even though we are grown men and grown women, we are still subject to discipline. Discipline. And I want to talk to you about that for a few minutes. Number one, I want to give you a a few statements here. Number one, discipline is not just for children. Discipline is not just for children. Certainly, how many parents we got in here? Parents. Okay. Okay. Yeah, parents. How many parents that you still have kids at home, teenagers and under? Okay, all right. So we got a lot of parents. Okay, um, now there's a lot of you, and you understand this. Okay, you, you, we got a lot of grade schoolers. We got a lot of uh, high schoolers, a lot of junior high, and your mom and dad's in this room, or you're here, and you understand that. Hey, uh, when I'm going to talk about discipline, I'm going to talk about the parent and the, the kid relationship. But here's what I want you to understand. Every adult in this room, here's what I want you to see as far as, as uh, discipline in your life. Did you know that um, every boss in here has to administer discipline? Every employee. How many are an employee of, a, of the man or the, the woman? Okay. You work for somebody. Okay. How many in here, you're, you're the somebody, you're the boss. Okay. All right. Where's my wife at? Is her hand up? Uh, yeah. No. Hey, you, you're the boss. Can I tell you something? You are dealing with discipline. Now, we don't call it discipline most of the time, but if you have people under you, if you're the boss, there are some things that you need to learn about discipline, how not to discipline and how to discipline. You know why? Because those employees are like your kids, right? Okay. That, that business is your baby. All right. And you've got to learn that. Now, listen to me. You employees have to learn how to be disciplined, how to respond to discipline, just like a teenager would have to learn how to respond to discipline from a mom or dad. Discipline is not just for children. Leaders discipline followers. And let me say this to you. God disciplines uh, Christians. Are you with me? God disciplines Christians. How many Christians do we have in here this morning? You're a believer. Hey, guess what? God is going to discipline you. Do you know that? I want to show you a verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, and I want you to write this down. And we're going, to, we're going to look at a few verses here in Hebrews chapter 12, but I want you to see this. And I want you to understand that there, I'm going to use a few words, and I'm reading from the King James here this morning. I want you to understand that when I say discipline and the word like chastening, we're talking about the same thing. Chastening is correction or discipline. You're handing down discipline. Uh, uh, And and that's called correction in the Bible. It's called chastening in the Bible. So these are synonyms, discipline, chastening, correction. So we're going to use them interchangeably here. Watch this. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. It's not fun to be disciplined. It's not fun to be chastened, but grievous. It stinks is what it means. Okay. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Here's what I want you to understand. Right in the middle of that verse, it says this. It's not fun. It's grievous. Discipline's not fun. Nevertheless, what's the next word? Afterward. Everybody say afterward with me. Afterward. Afterward. What is the key to discipline? Here's what I want. If you don't get anything else, get this this morning. Moms, dads, bosses, employees, employers. I want you to understand something. Afterward. Why are you disciplining? You're disciplining for afterward. You're disciplining for down the road. Why does a parent discipline a child? Because that child that is now three is going to be 33 one day. Why does a boss have to discipline an employee that steps out of line? Why? Because that employee is going to work for him for many years or for her for many years. And we don't want to repeat that behavior. Why am I disciplining? I am disciplining for afterward. I am disciplining for down the road. Kids, understand this. Your mom and dad aren't disciplining you because they hate you. Okay? (laughs) Man, I used to think my dad hated me, right? I used to think my mom and dad were, man, they're so stinking mean. They're so stinking rough. I can't believe they're doing this to me. And we, why? Because it's grievous in the moment, right? Why were my mom and dad disciplining me? They were disciplining me 
Because one day I was going to be a man, I was going to be married, have children, I was going to be leading a family, I was going to uh, uh, be uh, filling my niche in, in, in society, I was going to be doing what God called me to do, and I needed to know how to be a man, I needed to know how to carry myself. And when you, you are training, you are teaching, when you are training up a child in the way that they should go, why are you doing that? You're doing that, mom and dad, for down the road, Okay? It's just like anything else. Listen to me, guys. If you do not make the wise decisions today, you will not get the result afterward that you desire. Did you know that if you do not invest your money right now, when you get to retirement, you're not going to have it? Did you know that 30 and 40 year olds, you've got to make some financial decisions now. Why? For afterward. Down the road, if you're stupid with your money and you blow every bit of your money right now, you are going to pay the price later. And if you let your kids get away with everything, your employees get away with everything, you are going to pay the price down the road. They're going to pay the price, right? If we want good kids, we want good employees, we want to be good leaders, good moms, good dads, good bosses, we have to understand this area of discipline. It's for afterward. It's for afterward. Number two, God is a disciplinarian. Hebrews chapter 12, same chapter, verse number one says this. Wherefore, seeing we also, and you, you recognize these two words, these two verses. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy Set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We preach on Romans 12, 1 and 2 all the time. Run the race that God is before you. Run it. Jesus looked beyond the cross and he saw me and he pressed on, right? Now look at verse number 3. He shifts here in everything in the Bible. Verse number 1 and 2 are connected to verses 3 through 11. Okay? Here's what he says in verse number 3. For consider or think about, ponder on, him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Think about Jesus and don't give up. Verse 4. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. God is talking to us as children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. What does that say? It says, hey, Christian. My son, my daughter, don't despise the chastening or the correction or the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked by him. That tells us clearly that there are going to be times in our life that God is going to rebuke us. He's going to chasten us. He's going to discipline us. He's going to correct us. Hey, you may be 40 years old. God is going to discipline you or correct you when you are his child and you step out of line. He is going to scold you. He's going to rebuke you. He's going to say something something to you. Why? Because God is a good parent. Verse number six, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Do you understand what that says right there? Who the Lord loves, he chastens. If you have been made a partaker of his love, you're his child. Guess what? You can expect out of God. Hey, guess what you can expect? Discipline in your life. That's why some of you a long time ago, 10 years ago, when you weren't saved, you used to be able to do whatever you stinking wanted to do. And it was fun and it was awesome, wasn't it? It was great. Why? Sin's awesome. Sin's fun, man. Sin makes you want to do it again. I like sin, right? Man, that's fun. Then he got saved. And then you rebelled against God and said, well, I don't want to follow God today. I'm going to go. And you, you went back and you tried to do that old sin again. And guess what? It stinking stunk. It wasn't fun anymore. The joy was gone. Man, I used to love doing this. And now it's just like, man, I don't I feel guilty. Overrun with, with, with guilt and with shame. Man, I don't like that. And then you, you're, you're laying there and you're like, oh, man, I can't believe I gave in to that sin. Why? What is that? That is the voice of God. What's he doing? He's correcting you. He's speaking to you. It's the Holy Spirit of God that moved into your heart saying, hey, stupid, why'd you do that? Hey, why'd you do that? 
I love you. You're my child. Why are you? You're, you're not like that anymore. You're saved. You're supposed to be producing the right kind of fruit. Why are you doing that? And there's this internal struggle back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And you're miserable. Some of you are like, man, I'm miserable. I thought I was saved and I sinned. And I'm just miserable and I think I'm not even saved anymore. You are looking at probably the greatest evidence you are saved. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's whooping your butt. Amen? He whoops your butt, doesn't he? And you're like, God, why? You guys remember Lot? Lot was saved. The Bible says he was a righteous man. He's Abraham's nephew. He moved into Sodom and Gomorrah, the most wicked city he described in all the Bible. He moved right in there. He started, and it was a slide. He pitched his tent towards Sodom and started looking. Then a, few, a couple chapters later, we find out he's living right in a pit of, of sin. But he's a Christian. He's a believer. And you know what the New Testament says? It says that every day Lot woke up, and it vexed his righteous soul. It, he had a righteous soul. And what that verse means, he vexed his righteous soul. It means he was stinking miserable, living in the pit of sin while being a Christian. He couldn't enjoy it. He was miserable. You ever been miserable? You ever been miserable as a Christian? When, when, did, when did you, when were you miserable? You were miserable when you were on the run from God. You were miserable when you were not submissive to God. You were miserable when you were rebellious against God. You were miserable when you were out of his word. You were, you were miserable in those times in your life. You weren't in church. You weren't worshiping God. You weren't praying. You weren't reading your Bible. You weren't walking with God. Why? You are miserable when you're away from God because God is trying to correct you and bring you back to him because he's got somewhere that he wants you to go afterward. Amen? God's a great parent and he disciplines us. Okay? Let me read the rest of these verses. Seven. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. Okay? For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? He said any father is going to correct his children. Okay? No father just doesn't correct his children ever. No mother just never corrects her children. He said you are to endure it because God is doing it because you're his child. You're his son. You're his daughter. Verse 8. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Now, I'm reading old King James here. Okay, it kind of puts it blunt. All right. You know what he's saying? He's saying if you are not getting disciplined by God, you're not his kid. I've talked to people before who are maybe doubting their salvation. Maybe, maybe they're saying, man, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I really was saved. And I'll talk to them and I'll ask them some very pointed question. Okay. And they'll say, you know, maybe I prayed a prayer a long time ago. I walked forward in a church service at a youth camp or did this when I was 10, 12, 15 years old. And I prayed a prayer and I was kind of felt pressured into it and I did it. And I always thought I was saved. One of the things I always ask them is, and I always talk to him about is this. One way to know if you're saved, in, in, like outside evidence, is that if when you sin, is there that convicting Holy Spirit of God speaking to you? Because if you can sin, and you can wrap yourself in sin, and you never feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you, and you can just go on and on and on for year after year after year, and you never feel that guilt and that shame and that speaking to you, if you never feel that, the Bible says if you are his, he's going to chasten you. Now, everybody's on a different level of growth, okay? But I'm going to tell you this. When you accept the Lord into your heart, he is going to chasten you. He's going to, he's going to discipline you because he's a good parent, okay? And the Bible says if you don't receive discipline or chastisement, you're not his kid, okay? Now, verse number nine. Furthermore, we have, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. We gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So he's saying, you, you, you reverence your father now, and, and you guys know this, right? When you're 37, you look back and you say, thank God for a dad and mom that disciplined me, right? When I was 17, I didn't look back and say, oh, thank God for them for disciplining me. I looked, how the heck can I get out of this punishment? How can I get out of this, right? So you are to uh, be uh, in submission to mom and dad, but he's saying, be in submission to God when God corrects you and live. Verse number 10 and 11. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Verse 11. 
Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You're going to be better off down the road unto them which are exercised thereby. Now, let me say this to you. Um, number, uh, we, we said, number one, that discipline is not just for children. Number two, God is a disciplinarian. How many would say amen to that? Okay. Okay? If you're saved, you're going to get discipline. If you sin and you are saved, you are going to get disciplined. Okay. Now, here's what I've learned about God. God a lot of times whispers to us. Okay? And he'll be like, hey, Brent, stop that. And he'll, he'll kind of be, you know how it is. You're a parent. I think we get this from God. Okay? It's like, hey, stop that. And then I've had times in my life where God's like, raises his voice. It's like a lion's roaring at you. Stop it! I'm not going to say it again. You don't want God to raise his voice. Learn to listen to the whispers. Okay? Because God is, you're his child. He's trying to guide you in the right direction. He's doing it for your betterment down the road. But that's what I want you to understand. Okay? Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Do you know why you're supposed to be in the scripture every day? You know why Brandon gets up here every Sunday practically? He's like, read your Bible and pray. Read your Bible and pray. What am I supposed to do to be a good Christian? Read your Bible and pray. You're saved? Get in your Bible. Get in your Bible. Get in your Bible. Get in your Bible. Come to Wednesday night Bible study. Dig in. Get your Bible on Monday. Read it. Dig in. Dig in. Dig in. in. You know why? Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So you know what to believe. For reproof. For correction, for instruction in righteousness. You know what reproof and correction are? When I'm wrong, when I read the word of God, it screams to me and says, hey, you're not doing it right. And the more that I learn and spend time in in scripture, I am being disciplined by the Lord. And you know what? Listen to this though. Watch this. Moms and dads, you'll pick up something right here. Watch this. The word of God. It's profitable for doctrine, so you know what to believe. Reproof and correction, that is the, hey, you're doing it wrong part. But look at the end of it. It says, for instruction in righteousness. You know what good disciplinarians do? Listen to me, because it's what God does. He not only tells you where you're wrong, but he tells you how to get right. Do you see me? Mom and dad, don't just discipline and tell the kids where they're wrong. This is how you do it right. Hey, bosses, don't just yell at your employees and say you're stupid and this ain't how you do it. First of all, don't do that anyway, okay? Nobody's going to want to work for you. You come and say, hey, this is not the right way that we do it. This is not the way we're going to do it here. It's my business, okay? You're representing me. We're going to do it this way, but I want to show you and make sure you understand how to do it. Any questions, answer the questions, spend the time to train them how you want to do it. Instruct them. When you read the Bible, you're finding out what not to do. You're finding out what, to, what, what, what you're doing that's bad, but God is also telling you and instructing you how to do it right. Okay? And hey, can I tell you something? God's got something parenting-wise that I ain't got a lot of times. Patience. God is so long-suffering, isn't he, to us? Like, if I was God and he was me, like, I'd have killed me a long time ago, right? It's like, oh, my goodness. You never learn, Brandon. You ever say that to yourself? You never learn. You just do the same, every time, same stupid stuff. What are you doing, right? We would lose our cool. God is so long-suffering and patient. He gives us more chances than we deserve. He's patient with us. He's long-suffering. That's what we need to be as parents. Not God is firm. God is strict. But he's also patient. So we've got to weave and balance all of these things together. Now, let me, let me give you number three. Receive discipline with the right attitude. So I'm talking to the Christians right here, right? I'm talking to the employees who are going to get scolded because you did something wrong. Can I tell you something? When you, when you do something that goes against your company policy, when you do something that your boss said don't do, and you get reprimanded, okay, you take that with the right spirit, okay? Whether or not your boss does it in the right spirit, your job is to take. Can I tell you what not to do? Don't make an emotional decision because you got reprimanded at work because you did something stupid. I quit. You better think, hey, let me tell you something. Don't... 99.9% of the time, you do not have a reason to walk off the job and quit that day. Did you hear me? 
Did you hear me? I'll, I'll come out there and say amen. Okay? We don't need people saying, oh, I quit because somebody looked at me wrong or my boss said, hey, hey, I've told you twice how to do it. That's not it. And he comes down a little hard on you and you go, I don't like that. And I'm going to leave. You're an idiot. Your family needs money. Okay? And I don't want you on welfare. I don't want to put up your butt. Okay? I don't want to feed you. Okay? Hey, don't you do that. You, you, you work and you do it. And if you get your toes stepped on, you receive that instruction, right? You receive it. Have a good attitude. Can I tell you something? When the preacher comes in here, and on a Sunday morning he gets up and just lets you rip, and it's all up in your business about stuff you've been doing, you know what people often do in church world? I'm leaving. I'll find me another church. I'll find, I can't believe he said that. First of all, did he say what God said? If he did, take it. So many times when I'm preaching at you, I'm preaching at me. And I feel like, oh, it's like God's all up in my business. You know why? The Bible says that the word of God pierces. It's like a knife. It's like a needle. And it gets right down in there where it hurts and it says it separates all the way to like the joint and the marrow it gets that deep like down to the nitty gritty where everything comes together that's where God's going to get when you read his word he's going to correct you he's going to teach you receive it receive it receive it can I tell you something in church world you need corrected a lot of times you know why we're in a, we're in a mess in our nation because we have not we have not, our, our pulpits are silent on so many things. We have no ethics, no morals. We don't, we're not honest. Why? Because our parents are silent on things. Are you with me? I want you to understand something. We have got to instruct, but we've got to receive discipline with a good attitude. You teenagers, mom and dad's going to come down on you sometimes. They're going to come down hard sometimes. Sometimes they're completely justified in it. Sometimes they go overboard. Can I tell you, as a parent, sometimes I come down, and you know what? I probably handle a little too harshly. I'm one of those no-nonsense, boom. I got a temper, okay? I got a temper. I'm trying, folks. I'm trying. I pull up to drop my kids off so they can go to this gymnastics meet, right? And drop these girls off, and I pull up. Big Coliseum, uh, uh, they're, they're, they got cones going this way, got all these entrances, and I pull in, and I just want to drop them off right, right, right there. That's it. That's all I want to do. Just pull in there. I just want to drop them off. That's it. That's all I want to do. Okay? I had already been there for Ella's meet that day. I got a ticket, and it says on that ticket, no reentry. So I don't want to reenter. Okay? I just want to drop them off, and I don't want to give you five more dollars. Okay? That's what I don't want to do. Okay? So I pull up there. And, uh, um, you know, I'm nice pull up and I'm like, hey, can you tell me uh, where I can go to drop off? If this is not here, if it's not here, I'll go somewhere else. I just want to drop them off so I have to pay to re-enter again. Guy looks at me. He goes, you see that ticket on your dash? He said, what does it say? He says, it says no re-entry. And I said, I, I, I don't, I don't want to re-enter, okay? I, I just want, I'll turn around right here. Can I just drop them off, okay? And he gets lippy, and I feel my blood start to come up in me. And I'm like, look, dude, okay? And then I said, I said, I don't want to be disrespectful. I said, is it okay if I just drop them off right there? And then where you told me to go next time, if, can I just come back and pick them up right there? Is that okay? Yes. And he goes, that's fine, that's fine. We, we, we end. But it could have been bad, okay? <laughs> it could have been bad. Because if you bark at me, I'm going to bark back at you. That's my, okay? Oh, right? You just, oh, man, it gets my blood boiling, okay? But, but we, we, we've got to, we got to, learn. man, it's tough. We're not always going to like it. Now, receive discipline with the right attitude. Hebrews 12, verse 11. Verse 11, Hebrews 12, says this. No chastening for present seemeth to be joyous. It ain't fun to be chastened, is it? How many of your mom and dad disciplined you as a child? Okay? 
You got discipline. Maybe you were grounded. Maybe you were spanked. Maybe this. Maybe that. Maybe you couldn't go to the dance. You couldn't go out with your friends. You couldn't have the car. Whatever it was, it's discipline. And it stinks. It's not fun. It's grievous. But nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It's for our own good. Proverbs 15, 32 says this. It says, he that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul. If I push back against discipline, I'm actually, dis- I'm actually hating on myself. Because godly discipline is coming from a good spot that is preparing me for my future. And when I push back on it, I'm actually doing it to the detriment of me. If you refuse instruction, you hate your own soul. But he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. You know what, kids? If you'll listen to your mom and dad when they come down on you and say, Hey, uh, I told you to do this. You said you would. You didn't do it. You're grounded. Okay? If you, first of all, young folks, listen to me. Don't get mad. Don't slam the door. Don't stomp off. Don't cock that head. Don't have that attitude. Don't say those mean things. Definitely. And let me say this, and I've said this before, and and, and um. I heard this the other day, and I can't remember where, and if it, was, <laughs> if it was your kid, I apologize, okay? I hate you. Don't say that to your mom and dad. You say, you don't know my mom and dad. No. But don't you ever say you hate your mom and dad. Don't ever say that. Because one day, you're going to find out that your mom and dad are trying to do what's best for you. In 80, 90% of the cases, they're trying to help you, okay? They're trying to help you. Maybe they're not perfect, but don't you ever say you hate them. That mom went through giving birth to you. That mom and dad, that dad goes to work for you every day and he puts food on your table. He pays the power bill. Hey, maybe he ain't the best. Maybe he ain't the best communicator. Maybe he yells sometimes. Maybe he gets ticked, okay? Maybe he comes down a little hard on you sometimes. Well, let me tell you something. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't provide for you. Okay? Don't ever say, I hate you. And don't have the attitude. Don't have an attitude. Don't cock an attitude with your mom and dad because they're doing, you are to receive instruction. Okay? Now, let me say something to you young people. Some of you may have parents that they don't discipline you in the right way. Maybe they do some things wrong. Maybe they're not Christians. Maybe they're not here with you this morning. You're sitting in church by yourself by yourself because you've got more character than your mom and dad. Let me tell you something. My wife was that way. She had more character than mom or dad. dad. Okay? Do the right thing, but don't be disrespectful to her. Don't be disrespectful, and you file that away in your head, and you say, when I'm a mama and when I'm a daddy, I will not do that. And you make a mental note that you are not going to do that. But there's an attitude to correction. Let me say a couple things to disciplinarians. You are in charge. You're a mom. You're a dad. You're a boss. Discipline, listen to me, in the right spirit. If you got to jump on an employee, do it in the right way. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says this. And it's talking primarily about a pastor having to get onto a church member or something like that because of, of, of uh, something that's done. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, he sinned, he's done something wrong. Ye which are spiritual, notice these words, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. What's the goal of jumping on somebody? It's where? It's down the road. I am disciplining my child. God is disciplining me because he's trying to turn me into what he wants me to be down the road. A mom and dad disciplines a child because they're trying to get them to be the right kind of man and woman down the road. So you have to discipline and restore that person, okay? Discipline is not just to break them. It's not to punish them. It's not just to hurt them. I do believe punishment should hurt because it gets your attention when you feel it, right? If you were going to go out, now you can't go out and you can't have the car. Now you're grounded and you are going to go to that birthday party. You feel the pain. When you get paddled on your butt, you feel the pain, right? Restore such an one. But mom and dad, disciplinarians, bosses, why are you disciplining? You are disciplining 
for the betterment of that person. You're trying to make them better and restore them. When you come at it from that perspective and say, hey, I'm going to discipline my child. I'm going to discipline my employee. I'm going to do this. I've got to come down and I've got to make them better with the goal of making them better in the long run. Watch this. Restore them. Such an one in the spirit of meekness. You're to do it in a gentle way. Can I tell you something? Don't mistake that for being soft. Gentleness and meekness and godliness and steadiness is not soft. I'm going to discipline you. You're an employee. Maybe you have to fire them. Maybe no call, no show for two, three, four days. You can't have it. Hey, I appreciate all the work that you've done. This has happened. We can't allow that. It goes against everything that we stand for. We've got a business operate here. I'm going to have to let you go. Or you're going to reprimand them. Don't slam doors, hit things, throw things. Don't be a jerk. Mom and dad, don't be a jerk to your kids. You discipline them. You are, have to be in control. And a lot of us parents do not discipline when we are in control in the right spirit. We fly off the handle. We come down hard. We yell and we scream and we stomp. We're not doing it the right way. The greatest lesson I ever learned on that was my dad. When I got a spanking. And I got a spanking. And it was amazing. I got a spanking a lot when I was a kid. As I got older, didn't get them as much. But I did get them. When I needed him. My dad would always send me to my room for about 10 or 15 minutes prior to the spanking. I always thought he was torturing me. Because I'm sitting up there going, oh, crap. Oh, I bet it's going to hurt. You know, you're sitting up there wrestling with it. You know what my dad was doing? He was calming down. He was calming down. spank your kids in the middle of the store. See kids in Walmart. Hey, I see plenty of kids in Walmart need, need their butts wore out. Don't do it in Walmart. Can I tell you what a good parent does? Son, if you do that one more time, this is your last one. You do it, you get in a spanking when we get home. And be a good parent and a person of your word and when they act like they did it one more time, but then they straightened up, you get home and you say, you did it one more time. You remember what I said? You're going to get spanking. Why? Because I am going to follow through and be consistent on my word. Right? Follow through. Be consistent. You do that, you're getting grounded. Be consistent with it. But do it in the right attitude. Don't flop the handle. Hey, you, you, you teenagers, when you're a dad, when you're a mom down the road, you've got to learn to control your emotions. And when you are angry, dads, when you're mad, it is not the time to administer a spanking to your kids. Stop it. Do you know that people are fighting against spanking now? And oh, you can't do it, you can't do it. You know why? Because stupid parents disciplining their children the wrong way. I am tired of spanking getting a bad rap. God said, spank them on their tush, their butt, the padded part. It ain't going to hurt them. So he said, I padded it for a reason. He said, you, if, you, if, you, if you give them the rod, you're not going to kill them. Why? Now, let me tell you something. You know why it gets a bad rap? Because parents disciplining when they're hot. When they're steaming, when they're mad, and they do something stupid. Okay? You don't smack a kid. You don't spank anywhere but the butt. That's what God put it there for. You don't spank the legs, you don't spank the hand. My dad, I'd, I'd, I'd be dancing around and doing this and trying to slap him around. You know what he'd say? You're going to get an extra one. You're going to stand there and take it like a man. <sighs> Boom. Boom. Right? The more you fight, you're going to stand there and take it. Because why? Because my dad wasn't going to let a belt hit my hand 
for my arm. <laughs> I got a paddle. I got a paddle. My mom and dad carved this paddle. You know what that, they made me stencil it. And it says on it, that old hymn, I need thee every hour. That's what it says. And it says on there, it's a sick joke. This is how I grew up. I got that paddle. It's in my office at home, sitting on the shelf. It says, I need thee every day. And I look at it and I just scowl at it every time. Do it in the right spirit. Meekness. Do it in a loving way to restore. Now let me say this to the disciplinarian. It's not loving to not discipline. Oh, I want to be a loving parent. I'm going to let you off the hook this time. I'm going to be a loving parent. Let me tell you something. It is not loving to not discipline. In fact, in fact, Proverbs 13, 24 says it this way. Watch this, guys. This is going to get some of you. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. If you do not discipline, it's not because you love them too much to discipline them. You actually hate them, the Bible says. Do you hear me? If you don't discipline your children, you hate them. You say, Brandon, I do not hate my children. If you don't establish clear boundaries and say no and back it up when it's appropriate, you actually are doing, you're not, you're not showing love. People say, Man, oh, you know when a, when a parent's consistent and firm but loving? They say, oh, that's tough love. No, it's not tough love, it's just love. If I made my kid brush his teeth, is that tough love? No, I want him to have some teeth when he's 35. If you make him take a bath, is it tough love? No, it's just love, right? I don't want a stinking kid, right? You make your kids do things, you back it up because you love them. And if you do not do those things, if we see a kid that hasn't been bathed, hadn't brushed their teeth, we say they've been neglected, right? And rightfully so. If we do not discipline our children, we actually are hating on them, not loving on them. Are you with me? Some of you need to crack down on your kids. I love you, but you need to. You got a five-year-old or a six-year-old or an eight-year-old that's sassy and they're back talking you and they're saying things they shouldn't say to you and they're doing things like that. You have got to discipline that. Are you understanding me? I see it in the grocery store and I see it in Walmart. Hey, listen to me. You have got to, you've got to address that. And I understand. Let me tell you something. We've got moms and dads raising kids now who have no clue how to discipline. It's not your fault because your mom and dad didn't discipline you and you're trying to figure this thing out. I understand it. I'm so thankful I had a godly mom and dad that kind of patterned it. And so I kind of knew a couple things when I, when I, when I started. But I, hey, every, hey, my kids are about teenagers. I'm going to have to relearn the whole book again. Right? Because what works with a teenager is not what works with a kid. But you have got to discipline your kids. It's not love to not discipline them. Now, let me say this. Number four. And I'm going to wrap up here in just a second. Be transparent as a disciplinarian. Some of you need to have a family meeting. You need to have a family meeting. You need to come together and you say, okay, husband, wife, you, need, you guys need to get around the kitchen table. Set the kids down. He said, well, my kids, they won't sit down. They're eight or nine years old. They can't sit still. You know why? Because you hadn't disciplined them. You got, a, you got an emergency on your hand. And let, let, mm, let me say something. You don't start discipline when they're 12. Can I tell you when you start disciplining them? When they know. I seen these. They call it terrible twos for a reason. They do. They do. Can I tell you something? Hey, listen to me. Listen to me. I'm going to say something right here. I've seen babies that know if I scream and I cry, 
I know my mama is going to come in here and pick me up, and I don't want to take a nap right now in this crib. And they learn. And you know what? <laughs> I've been through that myself. When we had Dakota, he's a horrible baby. <laughs> he would scream. He would cry. It was our first kid. We always want to hold him, pinch those fat cheeks, poke him in the ribs, them rolls. Hold them all the time. They learn. They learn. And then, guess what? I can't put them down. <laughs> if I try to put them in the nursery at church, <laughs> scream. Try to put them in a nap. <laughs> you know what the best thing to do? Leave them alone. No. Don't. You leave that. Leave them in the crib. Let them cry. That's what we did with that. I was like, Psh. I ain't going through that again. <laughs> right? Let her cry. Let her cry. Okay, you, you know, just let her cry. Let her cry. Hey, let me tell you something. You can't wait till 12. Now, whatever the appropriate age is, if it's two, if it's four, what, whatever, you got to make that decision. I ain't your kid. I'm going to start early with mine. Okay? Because if you'll do it early and often, you won't have to do it much later on. Okay? But you have got to discipline. Be transparent. Have a family meeting. Gather around the kids around the, uh, the, you know, around it. If you're a single mom, sit the kids down. Husband and wife, sit the kids down and say on the couch, around the table, whatever, and say, look, here's what we're going to do, okay? There's going to be a change in our house. We're trying, we want our family to bring glory to God. And I know, I've heard from several of you, hey, you, you, you've started doing uh, uh, things with your family that you haven't always done. You started praying together. You started telling your kids Bible stories at night. You started uh, uh, reading the Bible together as a family, praying together, having breakfast, turning off the TV, doing those kind of things. That's awesome. But you know what? Around these di If you're having these discipline issues, you need to have a plan to discipline. If discipline is showing love and preparing them for down the road, then you've got to have a plan for it and say, look, we are going to be transparent to you. And me and mom have gotten together and we have have a list of everything that we think you're capable of we think you are capable of doing these things disrespect telling a lie bad grades whatever it is and you know what we have gone through and we've looked calmly and level-headed that you know what if you disrespect us you know this is what's going to happen and we kind of prescribe a sentence to the infraction are you with me okay and then we've got things that we ground for in our house you know that we got, we got things, if you do this, you probably get grounded. Because grounding, can I tell you something? Sometimes it's way more effective than spanking. And it depends on the kid. You got some kids that spanking is the only way to get their attention. You got some kids that if you ground them, it does far better because they're like, I can endure anything for like 10 seconds. Go, and I'll just do it again later. So they're like that. They're, a little, they're the devil. But let me say this to you. You should have things. Okay? Let me say this to you. If you've got littles, if you've got a four-year-old, five-year-old, especially, let me tell you something. If you're trying to start disciplining and they're 12 or 14, you, you, you're going to have, you're, it's, it's tougher. It's a lot tougher. It's not, it can be done. But it's going to be tougher. But if you, listen to me, parents. You parents of three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, you Spanking needs to be on the table in your life. Now, let me, I'm going to say something here because I hear this. I've heard it multiple times lately. We don't believe in spanking them. We're not going to spank them. I don't want to, I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to break them. You better. And I'm saying that, I'm not, not mad at anybody. I'm just saying, I hear it multiple times. Any, you know what I preach on when we get real specific? I, I, I preach on things that I hear multiple times. You better spank them. They, be, they need to learn that in life, listen to me, there are things that are going to cause you pain. They need to learn where the line is. They need to learn no or you're setting them up for a fall down the road. Be transparent. There, can I tell you something? There are things.
that you're not going to be able to imagine your kids could do. And you're gonna, you need to be transparent. You need to set that family down. Hey, if you do this, more likely you're going to get grounded. You do this, you're getting spanked. In our house, there's not many things that are spanking offenses now. Okay? Lying is. We're not raising a bunch of liars at my house. If you lie, you get spanked. Okay? Andrea too. Okay? I'm just kidding. <laughs> just teasing. Or am I? No. Okay. So. <laughs> If you lie, you get spanked, okay? We have grounding things. We do a way more grounding than we do spanking. We did a lot of spanking early on, okay? But you need to tell your kids, hey, hey, there's going to be things that come up. And if that comes up and there's something, I'm going to tell you how we're going to handle it before it even happens. Here's what we're going to do. Me and mom are going to get together. Me and dad are going to get together, and we're going to pray about this. We're going to ask the Lord to guide us. We're going to pray for wisdom, and we're going to come down appropriately in a calm way. And we just want to make that commitment to you. We don't want to discipline no more than we have to, but we want you to turn out. Right. You have a family meeting, a come-to-Jesus meeting. Hey, this is what's going to happen in our house from here on. Okay? If you do this, you're going to get grounded. If you do this, you're going to get spanked. If there's something beyond this, we're going to take it case by case, and we're going to pray about it, we're going to think about it, we're going to come together, we're going to be transparent. And lastly, let me say this to you, moms and dads especially, and I know this applies in a lot of different ways, but let me just hit moms and dads one more time. Mom and dad, be ready to be the bad guy for a little while in your child's life. That's a tough one for me. I, had, I haven't had to cross that bridge yet of being, yeah, I mean from time to time, but I'm talking about, well, if you do this, they're not going to speak to you. Or, you know, you got a 15, 16, 17-year-old that's not going to talk to you anymore for a while. Can I tell you something? If you're faced with that, you do what's right. I would much rather make my kid mad for six months or three months or three weeks than to, to set an example for them that's going to hurt them down the road. It's okay. You were called to train them up. You know what you're not called? And this pains me to say it because I love being this to my kids. You weren't called to be their best friend. You're like their coach getting them ready for life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. discipline lord <clears throat> you discipline us we have to discipline our children those of us who are bosses have to discipline leaders different parts of life we have to deal with this issue we pray lord that you'll guide us and help us our heads are bowed and eyes are closed i want to ask you a couple of questions here this morning we're gonna let you out of here if you're here this morning you say brandon i'm not sure that if i died today i'd go to heaven as you said at the first part of the service first part of the sermon and I want to know today that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I want to know that. And I'm not sure that I am saved, that Jesus has forgiven me of my sins. And I want to know that before I leave. If that's you, I'm not going to embarrass you. I won't have you say anything. I just want you to, while wow, everybody has their eyes closed, would you just raise up your hand and say, Brandon, pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure that I'm saved. And I sure would love to know how to be saved. Anybody like that? Just raise up your hand. I want to pray for you. If you're here this morning and you say, Brandon, <clears throat> I'm a teenager. I'm still at home with mom and dad. Pray for me that I'll have the right spirit while I'm a kid or teenager that I'll respond to discipline in the right way and glorify God with my attitude. If that's you, young people, I want you to raise your hand. I want to make that commitment today. I see those hands. I see those hands all over the place. God bless you, young folks. If you're a mom and dad here today and you say, Brandon, I want to be a better parent. I want to take these principles from the last messages that we've had on this subject. And I want to apply them to my life. We're going to think through this. Me and my wife, me and my husband, we are committed to doing what we need to do as parents because we're training our children for life. And we want to make that commitment as parents. Moms and dads, would you raise up your hands? God bless you. I see hands all over the place. If you're a leader, maybe it's in a
place of business, maybe you employ a bunch of people, and you say, Brandon, I want you to pray that God will give me the wisdom and show me how to be a better leader, and in the area of discipline, that I'll always glorify God in how I do that. Would you just raise your hand up? I see your hands all over the place of leaders. Lord, we love you. We need you. We praise you. Bless this group today. Bless us as we go our separate ways. Bring us back Wednesday night. Thank you, Lord, for speaking through uh, me to your people. Thank you for the songs and everything that was the, the singing uh, and uh, the way that we sung and glorified you. And I just pray you'll bless us today, Lord. We love you. We need you. Thank you for uh, everything you've done for us. Most of all, thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.